Well, there's smoke. There's fire here, folks. And, uh, you know, you may be asking, okay, so this came out. What next? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what next is we have a live stream this week. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. An explosive article dropped from the Globe and Mail today, which examined a report that was released by the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, or OPO. The OPO is a neutral and independent organization of the Government of Canada that helps resolve contracting disputes between businesses and the federal government. They also review widespread federal contracting issues and provide recommendations on how to improve them. They are one of the watchdogs that make sure the government is following their own process. So, let's take a look at the article. Arrive Can bids regularly listed subcontractors who never did work procurement watchdog fines. An investigation of Arrive Can spending has found outsourcing companies repeatedly won contracts by listing subcontractors who ultimately did no work. One of the many findings that led the Federal Pro Procurement Ombudsman to conclude contracting rules were not followed. The report specifically singles out contract work by two-person IT staffing company GC Strategies, saying the company frequently failed to prove that its proposed team of subcontractors had the resumes and work experience required. Gee, what a surprise. The watchdog found, quote, numerous examples, end quote, where GC Strategies, quote, had simply copied and pasted, end quote, the required work experience listed by the government in a points grid to describe the skills and experience of the company's proposed subcontractors. The report questions why the government used criteria that, quote, were overly restrictive and favored, end quote, GC Strategies resulting in the company winning a competition for a $25 million general IT services contract after no other bids were submitted. Alexander Jeglik is the first of what is expected to be several findings from various watchdogs, committees, and government departments into how the cost to build and maintain the app for cross-border travelers came to exceed $54 million. The Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, or OPO, released the report Monday as parliamentary sittings resumed. The report provides a sense of some of the issues that are likely to be described more broadly on February 12th, when Auditor General Karen Hogan releases her report into contracting issues related to ArriveCAN. The House of Commons requested the Auditor General's ArriveCAN audit in a 174 to 149 vote over a year ago, shortly after the Globe and Mail first reported on the app's growing cost and the federal government's heavy reliance on outsourcing. The Procurement Watchdog Review examined 41 ArriveCAN related procurements. In many cases, the ArriveCAN work was conducted through a task authorization, or TA essentially a carve-out for a specific job tied to larger contracts for general IT services. The report says the system is designed so that companies bidding on government work submit proposals describing the skills of specific individuals, referred to as resources, who would be subcontracted to perform the required tasks. In this points-based system, listing more experienced and qualified subcontractors increases the odds of winning the contract. Well, we went digging and we found the report, and it has some very problematic conclusions for both the government and Christian Firth. Here are just two of the conclusions drawn. OPO also identified issues related to the achievement of quote-unquote best value in many procurements. For 10 of the 23 competitive procurements reviewed, the use of overly restricted median bands in the financial evaluation of bids stifled price competition and resulted in rejection of otherwise high-quality bids without any efforts on the part of Canada to seek evidence to substantiate the more competitive rates proposed by some bidders. In roughly 76% of applicable contracts, resources proposed in the winning bid did not perform any work on the contract. When TAs were issued under these contracts, the supplier offered up other resources, but not the individuals that had been proposed in order to win the contract. 
While it is recognized that there may be legitimate reasons for some proposed resources being unavailable, the number of times it occurred and the absence of file documentation explaining why the resources were not made available raised some serious questions with these contracts. Okay, so what the heck does all of that mean and why should we be paying attention to it and should we be annoyed or concerned about it? So what this is saying in a nutshell is one of the main problems with this is that when GC Strategies was bidding on this contract, they were essentially doing what, you know, was accused of them in the Butler contract when they were committing resume fraud, right? So they were doctoring the resumes to inflate the requirements to put into this point system, as Christian Firth had said. The now, matrix, right? The, the matrix, yeah, exactly. So what he would do in this case, he, he was even lazier than what he was in, in the Butler case. All he did <laughs> is he looked at the request for proposal, which was the, the requirements that the government put out, copied the requirements, and then put them right into the matrix and stated, this is what my resources have. So it would be like if you were applying for a job and you see the job description, you would literally copy the job description and paste it right onto your own resume. Right. That's exactly what this is equivalent of. And that's that's fraud. <laughs> like You can't do that. Um, and so you're saying, OK, so they did that. That's a problem. I, I get that. What next? Well, what next is that 76 percent number. So when it actually came to doing the work, well, obviously GC Strategies didn't have the resources that exactly matched these alleged resources that they used to bid on the contract because they didn't exist because all they did is copied and pasted the government requirements into this matrix. So when it actually came time to do the work, three quarters of the, the resources actually didn't match the resources that they said they had in their bid. So they were lower skilled people that were actually working on this thing, right? So that's the problem. The other issue here, and this is probably the biggest one, is they're saying the government, AKA CBSA, used overly restrictive and favored criteria, meaning whoever wrote this posting, this RFP, cough, cough, Cameron McDonald, he made it so specific that there's only one vendor that would have been able to apply. And that was GC Strategies. And the ombudsman said, and the ombudsman is saying that. They said, you made this so restrictive that only GC Strategies could, could apply. Um, and you, you use that as your single source justification saying, well, only GC Strategies applied, so we had to take them. Well, yeah. Only GC strategies applied because you wrote it, so only GC strategies could apply. Now, the interesting thing here is that if you think back to testimony that Cameron McDonald and Antonio Utano gave, Cameron McDonald testified that he didn't write the RFP for this. The CIO would have had two proposals, two viable proposals. We need which to were, two. which were, Mr. Deloitte, Mr. Your, your uh, Mr. package, Deloitte. when you, yes. when everybody gets their packages, they'll see there's a Deloitte proposal that was sent by me. There's a GC Strategies proposal that was sent by Mr. Utano. I had a meeting with Mr. Doan afterwards. Mr. Doan told me that Deloitte was not an option. We talked about the fact that there would need to be a sole source contract. He wrote the alleged Deloitte one, whereas Antonio Utano allegedly wrote the GC Strategies one. So here's the problem. Now, if they're going to maintain that, well, now Antonio Utano has to wear the problematic conclusions that the ombudsman came to and essentially take the fall for it. Do you really think Antonio is going to take the fall for Cameron McDonald when we all know that Cameron McDonald is is most likely the guy that actually wrote the RFP for this? Because Christian's his buddy, not an Antonio Utano's. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting what happens when these two come back to committee and there's going to be a lot of finger pointing. 
I think so. Or they're not going to come back to committee separately. Utano is going to say, no, 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 it was Cameron the whole time. Or maybe plot twist, it was Utano. I don't know. But something doesn't smell right here, right? Now, there's a lot of other information in this report and uh, also in the article. Then later in the article, it goes on to talk about a... Uh, um, another finding, which is related to a completely separate contract to arrive can and everything else. Remember, we said that they need to be checking all of the other contracts and committee asked for that. So one of these is a $13.9 million contract um, that went without competition in April 2020. Who posted that contract? Cameron McDonald. So where there's smoke, there's fire here, folks. And... Uh, you know, you may be asking, okay, so this came out, what next? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what next is we have a live stream this week. And it's going to be on Wednesday night at 9 o'clock p.m. And it's going to be welcoming the Ombudsman as well as a, uh, a another gentleman uh, into committee. So they have them for two hours starting at 4.30 p.m. So we will be bringing you our analysis on uh, on the ombudsman and he can talk all about this report and all about the findings so this should be very very interesting and uh, I can't wait to hear Charles Souza say well this doesn't have anything to do with arrive can right Mr. Souza this report has everything to do with arrive can